housing's crisis is one that is not going away. In fact, it's getting far worse. In 2020, 8,404 people made the life-threatening journey across the Channel in small boats. In 2021, that number rose to 28,526. Now this year, it looks like the numbers will swell again, comfortably to top 40,000. The system is, as the Home Secretary herself admits, broken. But how did it become so broken? And why have successive Home Secretaries been unable to fix it? Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now is political commentator John Oxley, who on Friday wrote an incredibly incisive explanation about how we got here and, crucially, why no party is prepared to say the hard truths to fix it. Um, Thank you for joining me this morning. First of all, what has led us to this mess? There's a couple of different factors, Tom, that have built up to this. One, we have growing global instability that creates a flow of migrants and it's easier to move around than ever before. You know, say when we were dealing with migrants and refugees in the aftermath of the Second World War, it was much harder, much more expensive to move. That has diminished quite a bit. But also, at the same time, the government um, over many years has reduced and basically eliminated the so-called legal routes to entry. So you can no longer apply for asylum in the UK from outside of the UK. You can't go to your local British embassy, fill out a form and wait to see what the British government wants to do with you. Mm. And we've made it much harder to use, say, conventional methods of transport to arrive. You can't arrive in the country without a visa if you're from a country that's generally in trouble. Even from Ukraine, you needed a visa to come just on holiday. Mm. But to apply to a visa, one of the things you have to say is, I'm definitely not going to stay in Britain. I'm not going to apply for asylum. So if you arrive and declare that you are applying for asylum, the Home Office say, well, you lied on your form, that's an offence, you are now deported, you are banned from entering the UK. And sort of the final thing that has changed this is up until the Brexit negotiations, we had this agreement with France where the UK border was in France, effectively. So you could arrive there and if you made your way through the fences, which we saw a lot of, you were then technically on British soil, so you could apply there, but you could be held in Calais. Mm. And during that time, you sort of saw the other routes. So people climbing on lorries was very popular because you'd get through the Channel Tunnel, you would arrive at Folkestone, and that's where you present yourself. Mm. And all of that has been clamped down on quite successfully. Um, and so the only way left now is to travel across the Channel by boat. So it's like this game of whack-a-mole, really. All these other places have been closed down and people have been forced in to these boats. I suppose this is something that people on the conservative side of politics are reticent to admit, that because there is now no offshore application, because the only way in which you can apply for asylum is, frankly, by getting to the UK illegally, that's forcing some genuine asylum seekers to make this really treacherous and, indeed, illegal route. Absolutely that. Um, that If you're one of these people in trouble, I had it with um, some friends from Ukraine who I was trying to help earlier in the year, and I spoke to a lawyer, and they said, there is no legal way for them to get here. The only way is to take their risk and try and get onto a flight. Or otherwise, if you don't have the resources to do that, then you're forced to arrive in Calais to um, make a deal with these people smugglers and get across the channel or at least get far enough out that the people who rescue you are the British Royal Navy Mm. and they'll take you onto British soil and at that point is the only point where you can apply for asylum. Although for a time in Nice, the British government set up a processing facility specifically for Ukrainians and indeed for Syrians. We've had a programme with regards to uh, migrant camps over in the area and indeed for Afghans as well, there's been a programme. But I suppose outside of those three specific countries, there is no programme, no legal route for people to claim. And, and that muddies the waters. Yes, exactly that. That if you're you know, part of one of those well-publicised schemes, there is a route. That's what happened in the end with um, Ukrainians and Afghan- Afghans. But say you're caught up in um, some of the religious violence in um, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, you know, somewhere like Somalia, there is no scheme, there is no route and you're promised all sorts of things by people smugglers, and you end up in Calais. But of course we are seeing that in the last few months, a huge proportion, up to 40% of those coming across, aren't coming from 
hugely war-torn places. In fact, there's been a huge degree of Albanians coming across, a huge increase in the number there. I suppose creating legal routes for genuine refugees would not help that side of the issue. That wouldn't, but it helps the aspect of people sort of putting themselves in, because if legitimate asylum seekers from countries where you have a very strong meritorious claim can claim in a processing facility in France or even you know, in refugee camps close to their own country, it means that the illegal routes are only really being used by people who are trying to exploit the system. And so you can take a much tougher line with those sort of people. Mm. It becomes easier to process and deport them when they get um, into the country. And that's part of the other problem, that our processing is very, very slow. It takes nearly two years on average for people's claims, whether they're valid or not, to be processed. Why did it take such a long time? That's an extraordinary amount of time. It's a combination. It comes from both sides. But we have, generally in the Home Office, the process is very slow. It's very bureaucratic. It's not helped by, you know, you're generally dealing people with relatively low levels of English, relatively low levels of education who aren't used to dealing with the state. And then also you get a lot of legal appeals that get stuck in the immigration appeals tribunal system. Things move slowly through that. But what that means is if you have two, 300 people a day arriving on boats, which they do at the height of the crisis, and you're taking sort of 500, 600 days to process those claims, you quite quickly get a massive build-up of people in limbo. And that's ultimately the problem we're seeing in places like Manston, where these people are here, we're processing their claims. Some of them will have very valid claims, some of them won't. Mm. But for the time being, we have to do something with them. Mm. And um, we've not really invested enough resources in how we deal with it. You know, we can have all sorts of debates about the long term, how many people we're allowed to stay, what the criteria are. Mm. But we still have this problem of short term. How do we make sure they're housed, fed and not riddled with disease? Which yeah. I don't think anyone really wants. So because there are no legal routes, we get this big illegal problem and that's a system that's been gummed up by bureaucracy and by activist lawyers and we've got this sort of perfect storm where none of the real causal issues are being dealt with by politicians. It's a really uh, tricky, tricky mess. Let's hope that some politicians might listen to some of those uh, criticisms and hopefully work towards a system that can be uh, better implemented. But uh, for now, John Oxley, thank you so much for um, coming in and explaining all of that.